Morning, everybody. Hello. Can I introduce you to Martha Godber? Hi. Hello. Uh, unfortunately, John can't be with us this morning. It's unavoidable. But she has brought a dad. <laughs> is that all right? Where is he? No, he has gone. <laughs> <laughs> you don't introduce his young valley, you introduce his dad. All right, okay. And his dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're ready. Is it rolling? Because we realise most people watch this stuff online, so get yourselves here next time. Uh, Martha. Uh, this is business week. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel as if you're in business, a family business? Yes and no, I think. I think, because we are all family and it's like the four of us, me, my mum, my dad yeah. and my sister who work together, it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like it a lot of the time. But then I think when we get to more of the business side of it. I think when we're creative, it doesn't, because that's what we all love to do, and we all love to be creative together. So you're all performers there, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and creating things and splashing ideas around and things like that. But I suppose when it gets to more of kind of like the business side of it, which my sister actually does a lot of, um, then it starts getting down to business, I think. So it feels a business? Yeah. That. Was this always going to happen? Was it always going to turn? You know, when you was watching all this stuff, or you were growing up when you were little, did you feel it was, it was sort of always going to happen? It was going to be a family business? I did. I, I, I don't think I maybe thought it would be a family business. I think I'd, I always wanted to be in the industry, I think. Um, when I was growing up, I'd always, um, obviously having my mum and dad in the arts, I'd always go and go to the theatre and hang around the theatre and all these things just from literally being a kid. So I knew, I always knew I wanted to be a performer and do acting. And actually my mum and dad tried to put me off. <laughs> you don't want to do that. I was like, yes, I do. They never tried to like force me into anything. But I think it was only actually, we were saying the other day, it was only actually in lockdown really, when me and my sister were both at home. I'd just come back from university and we were all living together that we actually started to operate more as a family business and do everything together and, have meetings and that's when me and Elizabeth, my sister, actually really got involved in it. And I think going into the future, we'll definitely probably take more of a ownership of, of that as well. Harmonious family business? <laughs> <laughs> you can tell yeah. us it'll go no further. Yeah. We, can, we can cut this bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no, I think. I think because we're all very strong-minded people. Obviously, sometimes you yeah. do clash and everyone's very passionate, so yeah. I think that creates friction sometimes. Um, but in terms of... But then other times we really, really bounce off each other and, and create things that are really amazing. So I think it's... Do, do yes you and your sister that. feel you're dragging this, what's been a wonderful business, but dragging it into the 21st century? Because you do the social media, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think, I think that's been really important for my mum and dad, if you would agree with that, because I think obviously my dad's got such a legacy there and such a heritage, which has obviously come, you know, from quite a few years ago now. I think it is really important that you do kind of check in with me and my sister and think, okay, let's bring this up yeah. to the 21st century sort of thing. Not necessarily with my dad's work, because I think that's all really relevant, but I just think the way theatre markets itself and what kind of productions that you're going to see, how you market that on social media, how you create a modern branded website, how you create a brand that young people are going to see, because you want to get young people to the theatre, you want to get um, new people to the theatre who don't necessarily know my dad's work as well and things like that. So I think it's really important for us to to bring that and discuss that and bring it up to... Um, yeah. up so to you know the heritage, you've lived it, but it is about the now, so it's your part of your role to... Yeah, and like I now. said, I don't necessarily really think it's about the work because I think my dad's work is still really, really relevant. I, th I just think it's about the way you do bring it up to speed and not, not get it left behind because it has been around for so many years. It's like just... Yeah, just being able to... Obviously, everything's about social media now, and it, it, it's so instant. Do you think like, it is everything, Martha? 
I don't, I don't necessarily think it's everything, but I think for young people, it definitely is the first thing that everyone sees. The first thing you wake up is go on Facebook or you go on Twitter or you go on Instagram. So I think for young people, it definitely is. And we're so consumed by now, like even like TikTok, which is so instant and so quick that you need something that is instantly going to be able to be um, attractive to someone in an instant, you know? Yeah. So I think, and also just, just growing up, as a young person around social media, you just get used to what people find more attractive and appealing and what people are gonna click on more and all those kind of things. Mm. So I don't think it's everything, but I do think it's a very big part of marketing um, the productions that we, we do. Do you get left to it or, or are you bringing them along with you? I get left to it quite a bit of the time, don't I? Yeah, get left to it. Um, I think it's just like using your initiative and just trying to find opportunities as well. When, when we're out and we're on tour, I'm always the person that's like, right, we need to get a picture, we need to do yeah. this, we need to do this because um, because that's how you get people to know about stuff, isn't it? So absolutely, yeah. One thing that has intrigued me of recent times is is the foundation and the foundation almost being pioneered by one so young. You know, you've got it's normally people at our stage of our career that start thinking about legacy and give you something back yet you've driven this do you do you want to tell us a little bit about the yeah yeah absolutely um it was an idea that i came up with in lockdown again um and growing up with my mum and dad and being in the industry i always had you know like i said before a lot of opportunities of meeting people who are in the profession meeting actors i always wanted to be an actor so meeting actors um, sitting in on rehearsals, having those opportunities, like professional opportunities, if you like. And yeah. I think with the arts industry and being a creative, it is sometimes about who you know and not what yeah. you know specifically. So I kind of had this idea of, wouldn't it be great if we could give more people kind of the opportunities that similar to what I had? Um, I'm very passionate about Hull and, and, and the city. So I think there, there, some, there isn't a lot of arts that I think there needs to be a lot more in the city and I think obviously if you look at opportunities in London or even Leeds with young people and coming through in the performance mm. industry there's so much more than there is yeah. in Hull so I kind of had this idea of being more natural pathways when you no natural it. pathways and yeah. just yeah more natural pathways and I think I just had this idea of giving people opportunities and funding financial funding and mentorship and um yeah, professional opportunities who are all from Hull. So we kind of take students that are from the city who have gone to study elsewhere and um, support them alongside their training. I went to drama school myself, so I know all the ins and outs. Half the time you've been asked to pay for something that you didn't know you had to pay for and all those kind of things where you, you need it to kind of succeed in the industry. So I think what we try and do is help financially. So people who are from underrepresented backgrounds, working class backgrounds, something that we really champion, um, helping them with professional opportunities, linking up with people in the industry now. So whether that is like a Zoom with an acting agent or a casting director or something like that, um, getting free tickets to shows, um, coming to sit in on rehearsals, being able to help them with their careers, having Zooms with them all the time, saying you should do this or you should do this or let's link you up with this person. So I think it's just all about creating those connections and you have to be from Hull to be a part of the foundation. We've got 27 students on it. We've only been running for two years. Um, you have to be from Hull. So I think it's just about also bringing that talent back to the city as well and being able to say, you know, let's get people back here. We can create things here. And, and and just helping people and giving people a helping hand because a lot of it is really London centric. It yeah. is really that in this industry. So bringing it back here, helping people and 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 yeah, just inspiring the next the generation. The one I know most about is the Ocho project with yeah. Archbishop Sensimo. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was marvellous. Do you want to just want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, and I'm sure you'd be able to speak a bit about that as well. I think that was kind of Thank you. what started. <laughs> Shortly, honestly. <laughs> That was kind of what started um, the the idea, really. That was actually a project that my mum did, which was with Archbishop St. Amir Academy in Hull. Um, so that was taking students who were from that school, um, doing a play that my mum wrote and directed, and actually taking that out to Barcelona in Spain, giving them the opportunity. Uh, I think 
all of the students got places at drama schools around the country and some in Barcelona as well. Um, and again, just inspiring that next generation and giving them a professional opportunity to work with a professional company to boost their confidence as well and actually say, you can do this, you can have a career in it. And I think that's what's really important as well. A lot of young people maybe don't know that you can have a successful career in the arts and it isn't a pipe dream. There is a lot of other things you can do. You don't have to just be an actor. There's producing and there's creating and there's directing and all these different things. So I think it's about just inspiring and letting people know that they can do loads of different things as well. And on the foundation, we don't just have actors. We have um, costume designers and directors and lighting designers and everything. So. So, yeah. Well, that's such a marvellous project, you know, because it's a project with an outcome. Kids are doing stuff, not just good stuff, and then leave it. There's, a, there's an outcome to it, so that's brilliant. Uh, can I just talk about Dad for a minute? Please because do. Part, part, of, <laughs> part of my mission today is, because uh, I've been trying to figure out who he is and what he is for a few years now, <laughs> whether he's a playwright or an actor or a businessman or an entrepreneur. I personally have always thought he's an entrepreneur. Uh, but if I started kicking around some entrepreneurial traits with you, could you go, Yeah. no way, yes. Yeah. So entrepreneurial trait one, creates value from little or nothing. Yeah. Absolutely. Gets there no matter what. Very much can do rather than can't do. Yeah. Not phased by uncertainty or ambiguity or change. Big thumbs up. <laughs> you, very, you can't be in this. Yeah, very yeah. resilient against setbacks. In setbacks, just shows an element of resilience. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Anybody entrepreneurs in the room? Any, any, anybody? Anybody entrepreneurial trait? Rob, Rob's one of the biggest entrepreneurs I'm working with at the moment. What do you reckon, Rob? I reckon it's a lot. <laughs> An entrepreneurial trait we haven't mentioned. Um, I think you've pretty much covered it there, haven't you, really? I think I've made the case, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I think you've covered it well there. I mean, you know, so, kidding, would an entrepreneur choose Elbow to come on to? Why did he choose that, John? It's the only, it's the only trait we could agree on. <laughs> That, that both of us thought that meant something to, to, to either of us. Because I wanted to come on with Slade's Cos I Love You, and, what, and you wanted to come on to Busted or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Busted? I, I suggested that as a joke. Oh, well, OK, right. So we only ask, as a bit of an icebreak, what's the first record you bought and where do you buy it from, where do you get the money from? It's no good asking you that, is it? Because you would have bought a record. Mine was CD. Well, that was the CD I was, was saying. Was it? Oh, you've actually... Instead of you asked me, mine was probably busted, yeah. All right. So your first record back in the day, yeah. Because I Love You by Slade. Was it? Where, where was that from? Where they buy it from? Yeah. South Emsel Market. At the market. Mm. Where do you get the money from? My paper round. Your paper round. Mm. Could have guessed it. Yeah. Classic. Classic. <laughs> so that type of upbringing, obviously. Do you know... Talk to us a little bit about that. Bring yeah, it yeah, sure. Yeah, I, just before I do, would you mind if I just said a little bit about what Mars said? Yeah, sure. What, we, what the foundation also tries to do, just in particular, is is because you're absolutely right. It's who you know, not what you know. So what we try to do, we try to connect people up. So for example, there's a there's a lad called Prince from South um, from actor at Centre who was a Zimbabwean, and he's in his final year now at Central School of Speech and Drama. So I hooked him up with Roy Williams. You won't know probably who Roy Williams is, but the preeminent black playwright in the country. So when he got to Central School, he had a meeting with Roy and all these other kids are saying, how come you know Roy Williams? He's from Brixton, you're from all. Uh, so that's what we do. We set up these. Yeah. The, and and I think Mar's point was that you have to be born here. You, you can't come to the university because we have lots of people who come, not discredited the university at all, but you can't come from Lincoln and then apply because you have to be born in Old and East Yorkshire. And then another young student we've got who's doing fashion, we're going to tie her up with Sandy Powell, who's won seven Oscars as a, as a costume designer. So that's the, that's yeah. the, the potential of linking. And you, you perhaps wouldn't be surprised that when you see somebody who... <clears throat> somebody said to me years ago, a friend who worked in Los Angeles, 
And, and I, I tend to, I, I've never been really away for work because I don't like flying. So the times I've had to go to LA or Australia, I've turned them down because uh, I have panic attacks on airplanes. So I was supposed to be meeting Mel Gibson and I realized I couldn't go. So I lost eight grand and I never had the meeting. Uh, I shouldn't have booked it because I knew I couldn't go on an airplane anyway. So I got, I got carried away with the notion of meeting Mel Gibson. Um, but once you get these young people in front of somebody who's real, they actually, they, they unzip the kind of restraints of low ambition, if you like, mm -hmm. and they kind of go, oh, that's fine. Here I am talking to people who are players, mm -hmm. you know, and that's really rewarding, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, but no, I'm from, a, you know, I'm from a mining background, 47 miles down the road. Uh, I go there every week to see my dad, who was 92. Gets more left wing on an hourly basis. <laughs> uh, all he watches is BBC Parliament today. Uh, so yesterday I had to suffer Boris for two hours with my dad <clears throat> and all that, um, which, I, which wasn't a sufferance, it was a cathartic experience. Uh, but yeah, I, I wanted to play football at Trials for Leeds, like failed me 11 plus, at Trials for Leeds United. And then I got beaten up, I don't know if I've told you this, I got beaten up by the uh, former British light heavyweight. I'm into boxing champion uh, in my own house. Um, and his dad played for Wakefield Trinity. He was a winger, played for Wakefield. And I was about six foot three and about two stone. Um, and then my dad said, do you want to press charges? I said, no, uh, I'm going to get my own back. I don't know what, what this idea of getting my own back came from, but then my dad said, oh, did, did you know your uncle Eric was a self-defense instructor with the Gurkhas? I said, no. So I went to see my own cleric, and it was like a scene from Harry Potter. And it, it, <laughs> he, he was a smoking form of self-defense instructor with the Gurkhas who said, come with me. So I went down the garden, he opened a, he opened the garden shed and it was full of Gurkha knives. And he says, I said, what am I gonna do with them? He says, near my knives, what about them weights? You know, so I, I said, oh, I'll take them. So I, I, started, I started training and uh, I did, a, you won't believe it now, but I did a lot of bodybuilding uh, and, and Reg Park, who you may know became a big influence on Arnold Schwarzenegger, lived down Cambridge Street, which is two streets from where my uncle Eric gave me the weights. Um, so I, I, I had no interest in literature. I wanted to play football. I, I, I then I started playing a lot of rugby union, I trailed for, for Yorkshire, didn't get on. But during that time, I'd, I'd picked up the, the notion of theater and literature. And, um, Went to a comprehensive school. When you said picked it up, John, where, where, could, where, did, where did that come from? I don't know. I think it came from the fact that, I, to be absolutely honest, without being too kind of psychological, I lived on a, we lived on a typical 50s council house where all the gardens met at the bottom. And on, on one side of us, there was a, a kid called Eric Scott who had been in Armley for most of his life. And on the other side, there was a bloke called Arthur Royal who, who had learning difficulties. And, and between the two of them, it were bedlam. It really were bedlam. And I thought literature was a way to escape. So I started to read all the, all the classics, you know, from Balzac to, you know, Zola. Um, and then I, I yeah, I, it, was, it, was also, it was also very strange that being, being 18 stone and reading books in Upton, in 1972 wasn't the most uh, attractive trait, you know, because uh, you didn't do that. You, you played rugby, which I did, or you played football, and I'd kind of grown out of playing football. Um, so did, then I Did people think you were gay? In the yeah, oh yeah, in what? Yeah. In what? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, nothing wrong with, I'd, I'd have been. I had, it didn't tell that I never had a girlfriend, so that, you know, word got round. Uh, and I had a mate who were even bigger than me. Uh, who wanted to be an artist. So we were, li we were living with Nell and I, quite literally, you know, me and, me and Andrew. Um, so I went away, I didn't go very far away from home. I went to Bretton Hall, which was like 17 miles away. I was a, trained to be a drama teacher. It was such a shock. Uh, I don't know if, it, I mean, I've, obviously I read, I read your uh, autobiography and it was a very similar kind of experience of going to a, a place of further education and feeling, I thought everybody would be like me. You know, and there were only one me, there were only one person with a Yorkshire accent, and they'd all come from all over the place. And um, I found it quite difficult to fit in. Um, trained as a teacher, then I got the academic thing, went to Leeds University to do a master's degree. That was even worse, 
because he was further up the ladder, so you, you know, the, the, the pool, the gene pool had got smaller. And then I enrolled for a PhD at Leeds uh, in the work of John McKendrick. Are the, work, are the works of John McKendrick realistic or fabulous? I mean, you'll all be wanting to answer that question, I, I guess. And I did five years PhD, but I didn't get a grant because I'd run out of grant. Because if you remember, you only have four years worth of right. grant. Um, I was only able to do the MA because my granddad left me 800 quid. So um, I, I, that was his entire life legacy of 72, you know, 60 years at the pit, 700 quid. Um, council house, so that all kind of dissipated. Um, so I did this MA at Leeds, did a PhD, and then realised I couldn't pay for it. So I went back to teach at the school I'd been a student at, um, Minsterthorpe High School. Uh, and then in 1981, I, this uh, drama festival was held at Hull University. And I, my, a close friend of mine had killed himself. I, I, when you start to look at it, it's extraordinary. We'd been to a club in Pontefract called Kiko's. I don't know if you know it. Still there, opposite the Queen's Hotel. Uh, and it was advertised as Yorkshire's only Polynesian night spot. And it probably was in 1974, to be honest. <laughs> probably still is now, to be fair. Absolutely. Um, so we'd gone out there one night and we'd come back. And Steve had gone over. Steve was another big lad. We were, I was surrounded. We were all big lads. You know, it's like, it was like Land of the Giants, you know, <laughs> uh, from the mining. But it must have been all the large sandwiches we'd had as kids or something. But, and he, he killed himself. Uh, and I went, oh, my goodness. You know, and the police came the next morning and said, are you gay? I said, I don't think so. No, why? Because it was autoerotic and all that kind of thing. And I wrote a play about it to get it out of my system. And the drama festival was held at Hull University, and I, and I came along and met Anthony Mingella. He was in the drama department there at Hull. And we won this award, and we were from a comprehensive school. We were up against RADA, we were up against Hull University, Cambridge University, Stephen Fry were there, Hugh Laurie. And we won this award, which was extraordinary. And that was that, apart from playing a sevens game at Riley High School, where such my eye open, was my introduction to Hull. Um, so I came. I, I got asked, I got a phone call two years later by Mike Bradwell, who'd set up Old Troke, and said, would you like to come and run a theatre company in Hull? Uh, I said, yeah, I can do. So I came along to the interview, and Danny Boyle was in the uh, interview before. I don't know what happened to him, but he, um, <laughs> he was in the interview before me. He didn't get the job, because apparently he decided if he came to Hull, he'd do a play about fishing. And I think the board thought, well, we've had that. Yeah, you know, it was kind of obvious. And I said, I'd, I'd rather play about rugby. Um, so I got the job. And uh, at the first board meeting, the, 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 the chairman, who was Don Roy from the university, said, oh, it's unfortunate the company's insolvent. Uh, so I, it wasn't mentioned at the interview, that. It wasn't in the advertisement in The Guardian. How old were you then, John? 26. Um, so I said, what does that mean? They said, well, you're 78,000 pound in the red and you get a grand to five grand a year. All oh, right. So I just packed in a, a pension and a, a position as a um, head of department in a, in a comprehensive school. And I, I, part of my research degree was in German theater. And I, I'd intended to come and do a, a season of German plays in Hull in 1984. Uh, I suspected there wasn't a big appetite for the, the, <laughs> the works of Oscar Kokoschka in Hull in 1984. Um, so the board looked at me and said, what are you going to do? I said, I'll write a play about rugby league. And they said, all right then. So literally I came home, we lived in North Ferriby, bought an house for 20 grand, which was like amazing, Riverview Avenue. And uh, I said to Jane, um, I said, I, I, company's insolvent. What are you going to do? So I'm going to write a play about rugby league. So I went to St Mary's, um, up to Whitley Bay, to St Mary's Island, to the lighthouse. And in, in about four days, I wrote up and under. And we came back with the strips. And the, and the, 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 the fellow who the company then said, um, uh, we haven't got any money to audition. I said, I don't know, I'll, I'll make six phone calls. So I six people that I knew. One was Jane, who wasn't my wife, but is now, my mum. And um, Andy Dunn, who was in, um, who, who weirdly plays Alistair Campbell on the telly. Um, Chris Walker, who was in Doctors. Rich Ridings, who was the voice of Peppa Pig. 
Uh, Rich Lewis, who was a producer of Peppa Pig, and Pete Jeeves, who was the Orange Tango Man, and they're all people that I played <laughs> rugby with at school. I said, listen, I've got a job in Aldrin in the theatre company. Do you want to come? I've written a play about rugby league. So they said, yeah. So we came along, this is absolutely gospel truth. We started to rehearse. We got 10 days to rehearse because there was no money. On the day we were going to Edinburgh, Richard unfortunately got caught stealing mincemeat out of bins. Now, he claims he, he, claims he wasn't stealing mincemeat, but he... We were about to get in the truck, because that's when Old Truck had a truck, and the, the administrator said, um, one of them's not here. I says, where is he? He says, he's in Queen Street um, Police Station. He's been arrested. So we got him out, and we, we took this play to Edinburgh, and I thought I'd written a serious play about rugby league, because my master's degree was on David Story, who the spot in life and all that. And we performed it in front of the 342 people, never forget, first performance at Edinburgh, and um, they all started laughing. <laughs> and I was, I was sat in the wings thinking, what's going off here? And people were coming off going, what's happening? I don't know. I was, keep, just keep doing it, you know. And at the end, the audience stood up and, um, and somebody said, what a cracking comedy. And I just stood there with, like, with my head in my hands, it's not supposed to be a bloody comedy. <laughs> and then cut forward nine months, I, we got a phone call and it was, um, did you know that you'd been nominated for two awards? One's the best director and one's the best playwright for the Olivier Awards. I said, is it a joke? I've only been in the job six months. It's, no, it's not a joke. And eventually, um, they, 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 they whittled it down and we were nominated for best comedy. So I'd been in the job for nine months. This award comes up for best comedy and we have to go to Drury Lane because we'd got no money. So we all hired suits out of asses in all. And we got no cufflinks, so we'd all got paper clips holding us stuff together. And we drove down, and as we arrived, the guy who owned the theatre said, oh, well done, you haven't won, but thanks for coming. <laughs> so I thought, bloody hell, we've just driven all the way from all, you know. Anyway, we get sat down behind Ian McKellen and Andrew Lloyd Webber, me and Jane, and they're looking at us like, who are they? And we're looking at them like, that's Ian McKellen and Andrew Lloyd Webber. And then Anthony Hopkins comes on and he's giving the award out. And he comes and he says, and the winner for best comedy is up and under. So I think, oh my God gracious. So I get up, there's footage of this. This is, this, if you Google how not to receive an award, <laughs> it's me receiving the Olivier Award going, oh, bloody hell, oh heck, oh sorry, oh shit, oh heck, <laughs> and all that. And then you had to follow Anthony Hopkins off the stage so I follow him, but I look round and I wave at Jane like that, way like that, and he's gone into the wings. So I open the door and I'm out into the street. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a Dickie Bow on and Olivier Ward stood in the street and I thought, oh, I'll ring me mam up. So this is before mobile phones. So I go and I get 10 pence and I put it in the thing and I ring me mam and I say, mam, I've just won a Lawrence, Lawrence Olivier Award for best comedy. And she says, it's foggy here. <laughs> <laughs> and it was that, that kind of... You know, yeah. counterpoint yeah, forever that just kept me where I was. But yeah, that's that's how I came to Hull. And that was a breakthrough for Ultra. That was a, that was a massive turnaround because we went to Edinburgh that year again. I, 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 it's so long ago, but this is before credit cards and stuff. And we'd made forty-two thousand quid in three weeks. That was an absolute fortune. So we so we come well, we had it in a bag. So we, we bring it back, and we were each of us having a look at the money. You know, it was like going to the office and look at that. We've never seen as much money. Look at that. Whoa. You know, and all that. And in a way, uh, that model of, of, of writing something that was local, writing something that was about the area, and it was physical and all the stuff that I'd done the research degree on, helped. Um, and we went from nobody coming to Spring Street to, you couldn't get a ticket because obviously, you know, all the rugby fans uh, came along to see how we were going to portray their, you know, their beloved sport. Was there a, a naivety in the business sense yeah. that, that helped project the trajectory? Without question. Didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. Quite, I mean, the problem when you, I guess, I don't know if the same in business, but in, you know, having written 74 plays, um, now I'm more knowing than I was when I first wrote Bouncers, which, because I wrote Bouncers before I wrote Up and Under. I wrote Bouncers in, uh, in my bedroom at home for a company in, uh, in, in Rotherham. Um, and the naivety 
of writing up and under and think we'll put rugby on stage. We'll put a game of rugby league on stage. Now I'd think we can't do that, it's just impossible. Um, and actually it's interesting what Mars said, that sometimes you have to remind yourself, and it's something that I think you said, uh, I picked it up somewhere, where the first thought isn't necessarily the worst thought. Yeah. You know, so you, what happens is you start to, you start to think that's a great idea. Oh no, it's not because bang, 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 bang. And if your instinct is that's a great idea because, then you have to remind yourself that, that, um, that that's worth uh, investing in. So we've turned this company around and we're on this trajectory that I guess ends up in, in a brand new theatre for yeah, Hull yeah. and you becoming who you are and, 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 and as known as you are. Yeah. It seemed it seems from here that it was a, a quick, but it wasn't, was it? A, a number of years. How oh, many years was it? Twenty six years. Twenty six. Twenty six years. years to get to the new fit. I, I tell you, I was thinking about it this morning. I remember coming in one day, and and bouncers was the thing that when I was at Truck, we did every year. We didn't do it because I wanted to do it. We did it because it was a cash cow. Yeah. That every time we did bouncers in Hull, it was, it sold out like that, bang. And I just think, blimey. And, and, and honestly, I got a bit embarrassed by it. Well, they're doing bouncers again, but that would pick up the shortfall on another production. And I went into the office one day, and it used to say bouncers by John Godber, bouncers by John Godber, bouncers by... And we'd had that for about 10 years. And then it said John Godber's bouncers. And I kind of went, oh, is it, my, is it my bouncers? And that was a real interesting turning point, because I kind of realised I'd become a kind of commodity. I, I actually felt more comfortable with the play being above my name. I, I, I don't like seeing my name. I'm a bit embarrassed by it. But to see John Godber's bouncers, I, I thought, oh, I'd become, it was almost, almost like a kind of cult of the personality, which I'm, I was uncomfortable with. Um, but yeah, during that trajectory through to the, to the uh, Ferens Way, the new, new truck, that would, you know, it would be up, down, in, out, su massive successes, huge failures. The support system from that was the city council funding and the arts council because you know that's very different to the operation we run now in those days you were more or less guaranteed you'd get x amount but still you you know and again absolutely naively you'd get that amount of pie and you had to cut that amount of pie up between the people you'd got and sometimes, you know, I've written a lot of plays with two people in, a lot of plays with three people in, a lot of plays with four pe people in, only two with 23 people in. And it's no surprise that those plays don't get performed much. And now post-COVID, everybody's ringing up saying, have you got one with three in? Because the, you know, theatre is still um, uh, challenged. But I wasn't aware that it was, I was breaking any mould. I just thought that's the way to keep the ship going. And it was purely about, we used to say in board meetings, everybody run to the left. You know, because if it would, you know, we're listing, yeah, right? Yeah. Everybody, everybody, bouncers, we're no bouncers again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and that would, that would right the boat. And then, we'd, and then we'd try to do something. I did a production of Wojtsek, which is part of my research degree, a, 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 a German play in the 1830s. And nobody came. And I mean, nobody. Some nights we just sat about talking. <laughs> no, nobody came. And um, somebody said to me, I did a, a literature conference, and somebody said to me, you must have been a, in a, a foul mood when you wrote that Wazix. I said, well, I, I didn't write Wazix, and it's, it's pronounced Wojtsek. And I, but I was in a foul mood when nobody came, you know, and, and it, was, it, was, it was interesting, because what we tried to do, we tried to build a, a local audience on work that they knew, and then, and then stretch the envelope by giving them work that was more challenging to them. Yeah. And like I was saying to Paul earlier, that it's interesting that the theatre is a business model, that it destroys itself on a monthly basis. So if you think, and I remember Alan Aikborn telling me, I think it was, is it Mick McCarthy who owned McCain Oven Chips? They had this big to-do, to I think. So you've got two giants of industry, Alan on the one hand and McCain Oven Chips. And, and, the, and the guy said, why don't you just keep that on? Keep that play on, you know, because it's doing well. But the problem with regional theatre is you can't keep a play on because you keep, if you keep a play on, you lose your Arts Council grant. 
So we could have probably put bouncers on in all in 1984 and it would be still on today. Mm. Because, you know, an old truck and the coffers would be really, really deep. So, so the, the business model for the arts is, is unlike, for example, you know, making a cream egg. Once you've got the cream egg formula, just make a load of cream eggs. We make a cream egg and then we burn it, smash it to bits, throw it in a bin and say, right, what are we going to do? <laughs> Let's I've, make a cream I've, egg. No, we can't because we've just had a cream egg. <laughs> I've, I've always seen the innovation of, of getting theatre to be really low cost with a couple of actors and a mm. poxy set mm. as a whole truck, you think. Mm. Was it or was it happening elsewhere? It was happening elsewhere. Stephen Burkoff was doing a similar kind of thing, but it, but it wasn't as pared down. I mean, we literally, on Up and Under, the budget was 500 quid for the, for the whole thing, you know? And, oh, crikey. So we got the carpet from Pocklington Carpets on, on Spring Street. I think that was 150 quid, just a green carpet. And then I went down in the van with Barry to pick up the weightlifting equipment from Islington. So we bought it second hand from a gym that were closed. So we got all the equipment. The rugby ball, yeah, 30 quid. The kits somebody made in their, down the avenues in their uh, uh, living room. So the whole thing was uh, 50 pound. So when we took it to the West End after it won the award, and we dealt with Bill Kenwright who owns Everton, said, what's the budget? He said, 500 quid. 500 quid? I said, yeah. I said, how have you done that? I said, well, that's all we've got. We could, only, we could only work with that. Um, and Bill put me up during that's the That's now going to the Subble Group, that principle, by the way. There you go. Well, yeah, I'm sorry to burst any balloons, but yeah, that, it, that, that's... Yeah, we... It, it was a very, very naive and, and kind of bovine notion that we'd look at what was in the pot and I would write a play for what was in the pot. Mm. For example, Teachers, which Mars in, which I've rewritten, which is on now, um, we got no money in the pot at all. So I said, what, what we got in the pot? And Barry said, we got 100 quid. I said, well, I'll write it for 100 quid. So I wrote Teachers for 100 quid and obviously it paid back, you know, t m many times. But I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur. I just thought I wanted to keep in a job that I liked doing. Um, and if, and I was able to, because the work became successful, because it was cheap, you know, because lots of theatres during the late 80s, early 90s were going through situations where, we, you know, we want to have cost-effective work, and you'd like to think they were good plays, but first and foremost, they were, they were, economically viable. So, you know, we had, I mean, during lockdown, Antonio Banderas uh, produced On the Piste in, 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 uh, in Malaga, and we got invited, but we couldn't go because Jane would absolutely went crackers. I um, can't understand why. But, uh, but that was just a six-hander, and they, they built almost an entire ski slope. On, on, when we did it at Spring Street, with just a bit of, you know, AstroTurf. But you, you just took the nuggets of the, uh, of the production and, uh, and, uh, and built around it. But cost effectiveness was always... What about the income streams, John? So we're still on this 26-year, very long trajectory. Mm. Did the income streams build or were the income streams always the same? No, the income streams, in fairness, built because to start with, the city council support was pretty low because they just refurbished the new theatre going back then before William MacDonald. And then as we progressed through, and don't forget, Hull wasn't on the first glory of the garden. That was the Arts Council's look at the city, at the, at the country. And I remember looking at it thinking, well, where's Hull on that? It didn't, Hull didn't exist. Um, thereafter, the Arts Council got more uh, invested in the company and the City Council got more invested in the company. And as, when the new theatre came on stream, the potential of that, then there was, there was more subsidy coming from the city. And don't forget, early on, it was also East Riding Council. So East Riding, I think, would put money into Old Truck and Old City would put money into Old Truck and the Arts Council. So you got this triumvirate. And, and, and there was, without question, without that support, it wouldn't have gone forward. And that's the case now for most regional theatres, that without subsidy, the thing falls apart. Um, during COVID, the National and the RSC have been loaned millions from the government that they've got to pay back. 
How they're going to pay that back with a shrinking audience, anybody's guess. Well, from Spring Street to the whole truck we now see on Ferrens Way, I think uh, I'm rather pleased they managed to get round to name a studio after last week or the week yeah, before. Yeah, it was great. It was a bit, <laughs> sounded a bit, sounded a bit surreal um, for me. But yeah, it's lovely. Alan well, Abram told me not to, not to ever have a theatre named after yourself. Uh, but since I didn't name it after myself I, and somebody else named it, I feel kind of exonerated from that. He says, you don't want somebody to come out and say another bad godber in the godber. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about the exit, John. Yeah, well, I, I left Old Truck in, in 2010 simply because um, the, ab the absolute truth is that I got offered the chief executive's job and uh, by Roger Lancaster, the head of the Arts Council, and I felt as if I'd, I'd kind of done my stint. My, my mum had just died. She'd had a brain tumour. I'd nursed her through that. Uh, we'd done all the kind of eight years to get to where we were. And I was a bit, I, I was still a bit naive because I, I didn't want to be the chief executive. I didn't want to be the person for whom everything, you know, stopped at my door. I thought I'd, you know, I wanted to be the Ronaldo figure. And I'd never taken a full salary, so I, I wasn't on the, on the kind of, um, on, on the, on the... And I'm John, can you stop there? You said the Ronaldo figure there. Mm. What, what, do, what do you mean? Well, I could play anywhere. You You'd bring me oh, in. I thought, I thought you meant you could, went running and took your jersey off and showed your abs. No, 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 no sadly not. Um, but I'd, I'd also never had a contract, so it was all on a, on a, on a, on a kind of verbal agreement. Um, and then once I'd said I didn't want to be the chief executive, the board said, well, they, they needed a chief executive in place. And there'd been some behind-the-scenes shenanigans as they're all this all this is with these things, and they brought in somebody who I thought was utterly not right for the, for the job. Um, and they'd made a mate of mine redundant, and I'd been there when he'd, his mum had died, and I'd been there when his wife had died. So I did what any 18 and a half stone Yorkshire playwright would do, I, I left. Um, and I left because I thought, what? They were throwing away everything that we'd created. Um, and there was a sense of, you know, well, Spring Street was that, but this is going to be something else. And I tried to point out, but yeah, that's absolutely right, but the audience haven't just come from Amsterdam. Your audience is the same audience, you know. You and remember, there was a little bit of... Sorry, Matt, do you remember that time, Martha, when it came to an end at Hull Truck and Hill? Or were you too young? Yeah, I do, I do. I, I mean, I was in the show that opened the new Hull Truck Theatre when I was, like, 11. Um, so, yeah, it must have been about... 10, 11 as well. Yeah, I remember it, but I, I didn't really un understand the ins and outs of what was actually going on at the time, I don't think. Yeah. So now you, you're into a startup. So we've done turnaround, we've mm. done growth. We're doing business, aren't we? Now we've got, we've got a startup on our hands. Yeah, I think what happened was um, I would have left. I mean, without question, 26 years enough anyway, and I would have left. I would have preferred to have left under a different circumstance. But I left because I thought I was doing the right thing. And of course, I, I realised what had happened was members of the board thought they had the rights to all my plays. And in fact, they had the rights to none of my plays. Uh, I have the rights to all my plays. Uh, so they were, their, their knowledge base was quite thin. So I thought, oh, I'll set up. And, it, and, and then this goes back to John Godber's bouncers. And I thought, oh, I've become a brand. And why did I call the company John Godber Company? Well, because Peter Hall had called his company the Peter Hall Company. And there's a theatre in Stratford named after a playwright. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll call it the John Godber Company. It wasn't out of ego, it was, it was to do with right. branding, you know. Yeah. So we set up this, we, we set up a model, very simple model, uh, where we would, we would commit our own money. That was the difference. The difference was not using Arts Council money or money that had come in from uh, uh, City Council or East Riding, but it was our own savings. And that really focuses your mind. So the first, the first tour we did was I wrote a play called Debt Collectors 11 years ago about, about two out of work actors who, who get jobs as debt collectors. I, and weirdly, some of my mates have become debt collectors. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just took it on a big tour and it did, it did very well. So we, we covered our investment and we put that in a little tin. And that's what we've been doing ever since. We, we refresh the investment button. So every time we go out, and we're going out in August with another one, we've just been out 
uh, with a little um, little tour, and uh, then we did one last last year. So we we do two. The model for us is we do two shows a year, and we risk low. So we risk about fifty thousand quid. Um, it's great to get that back. Um, it's great to get that back. Plus, some people risk big. David Pugh, who is a, a West End producer, he risks big, and on art, he they grow with fifty-four million. Andrew Lloyd Webber risks big, and uh, Phantom of the Opera has earned nearly a billion pounds. Now that's that's a serious business, but he's also just lost twenty-eight million during COVID, and you might say he's able to lose that. So again, we we are very very cautious. We don't play theatres that are too big. We don't play theatres that are too small. We play theatres that are just the right fit, 400, 500 seats. We keep the cast size manageable. So we don't, we don't walk in with a cast of seven because a cast of seven is really on tour a cast of 10 because stage managers and all the rest of it. Uh, and what we're finding is that we have a, we, we go back to places that we start in Wakey only because my dad's in Wakey and, and, and it's easy to get my sister lives there. So um, we'd start there. We were going to start in Scarborough. So we do Scarborough, Wakefield, Halifax, sometimes Liverpool, Bury St Edmunds, um, Oldham, Scarb. Scarborough, Harrogate. And we do all the places that we used to tour to when whole trip toured. So that's, that's the business model for us. The, the advantage I have is I have another income stream, and it's the royalties. So whenever anybody in a school does bouncers or teachers or shakers or whatever, they have to pay for the rights to that play, and that's all over the world. So any, and any amateurs who do the work, so that's another income stream. Um, and then there's television um, which is a, and radio, which is a potential income stream. So, again, in terms of a business model, we're not just putting plays on. We're putting plays on, but we're also um, receiving royalties, discussing television ideas, pulling in um, amateur, amateur royalties and, and, and rights and book sales and all those kind of things. Just one on its own wouldn't work. I love the idea of the John Gobbler co-finance director having a tin. Well, it's almost a tin. Yeah, it's almost <laughs> a tin. No, no, honestly, you strip business back to its essentials. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. I grew up on a kitchen floor counting the money that my dad took on the market stall yeah. and, 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 and sectioning it off for the uh, various people who owed money to And What was left was ours. Nothing different at the Soul Group. You know, if you can get back to that essence. Do you know what, Paul? That, what, when we were building the new theatre, Gareth, who lives in South Cave, who, was, who got made redundant, that's why I left, he, he knew a guy who ran a massive, massive firm in, in the Midlands. And I think they were scrap metal dealers or something like that. And the, Gareth said to me one day, he says, this bloke's just got a bit of paper and he's gone, right, how much does it cost? Line down the middle. It costs you that. We're taking that. That's his profit. And, and all through our time at Old Truck, we'd kind of go, right, what can we do it for without abusing anybody? So everybody gets paid. Yeah. What will it cost us without us? I mean, I, once, we, I, I commissioned the first play on Philip Larkin from um, Alan Plater. And the designer, really, really good designer, wanted a trumpet on stage. I, you probably don't remember it. but And the trumpet cost 230 quid. And we had this massive argument. This is about 1991. That Barry wouldn't let us buy this trumpet for 230 quid. Because an actor only cost 90 quid. And we had this really, really serious conversation about that the designer wanted a trumpet on stage. And eventually I said, oh, well, I'll chuck in 90 quid then. So we compromised and we got the trumpet. But the, all, all yeah. along it was, about, it was about what was in the tin. We're simplifying stuff. You know, we, we do massively complicated stuff, don't we? I get spreadsheets and graphs and, you know, that's the simplicity. And if you can get back to the simplicity of business, you can be successful. Mm. Uh, so apart from that, what, what do you think the arts can bring to business? Because, well, I... apart from, do you remember, we, we have a Star Award at school where we have our Oscars and all the stuff, and we, we, we took them to the old yeah. Hull truck. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. We took them to the old Hull truck and they, they thought they were going just to get their star awards and go up on the stage for, 
you know, best this, that and the other and uh, and they saw a production of Bouncers and the Bouncers and John gave the prizes out. It was the most fantastic night. God, it was a right one. I remember it, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was apologising all night for the behaviour, wasn't I? You yeah. said, great, it's like the old Bouncers this in the 80s. Yeah, 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 yeah. To no, it. No. And you know, most of them had never been into a theatre and they had such fun, a lot of them now go to the theatre. I think what's interesting is we've, we, and again, like with the business side, we, we think we're all consumers. Certainly post-COVID, theatre is struggling. The national average used to be 66%, it's now 41%. That's across, across the country. Uh, in fact, the production at Trucks booking that trend, it's doing, it's doing very well. Not what it could do, but it's, it's actually doing very well. Um, my belief, but I'm, you know, I'm from a you know, working class uh, council house estate, is that you, we, we continually need to turn people on to the potential of the arts, because it's educative. Um, when we were building the theatre on Ferrens Way, uh, there, was a, there was a young fella and a, and a girl, and the girl had got a, a doll in a pram. And I think they were doing a thing called Baby for a Day, right? And I remember I was walking past and this young fella said, what, what's this, mister? I said, it's a theatre. He said, what's a theatre for? This was 2009, right? Not 1894. I said, right, you should put plays on and you can put bands on and, and, and poetry and, and comedians and, 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 and express how you feel about the world. Oh, blimey, God, blimey. And he, and he, and he, and he walked away. For me, the relationship between, the Germans have got it right. In Germany, unions subsidize the arts. So there's no kind of, you know, us and them. The more we break down the us and them, the more both parties benefit. And I think that's the same educationally. You know, we, we, we still love the fact, I was there last night, we, I'm working on a telly thing, and Paul knows, and I don't, I, I kind of don't speak it out loud in case it don't come off. But I've been working on it for two years, and, it, and, and it's a it's a big series that we're on the on the brink of doing. Do you mind if I talk about this a little? Mm. Uh, and we, we've tried over time to bring industrial size television production to the region. Um, I made a I made a film in 2000. When we made up and under, it was supposed to be shot in all. It was shot in Cardiff because we couldn't get bonded, right? which means we couldn't get the insurance to borrow the million dollars to make the film. That was for the film, not for us. Then after that, because I'd set up Brookside with Phil Redmond and I'd worked on Grain Jill and Crown Court and various other tellies. And then 2005, we made a film in Ferriby that won two BAFTAs. It beat Fungus the Bogeyman. It, it was a weird night for me because it was the day after my mum had died that we went down to the BAFTAs and the budget for Fungus the Bogeyman were four million quid. And the budget for Odd Squad were 180 grand. And we used all local actors, filmed it in Ferriby, and won two BAFTAs that we were given to by Tony Blair's son, weirdly, and Russell T. Davis. So we thought that's the start to make industrial level television production in the region. So we bring a lot of people up. And I said, I've got this idea, set at all Rome, right? So the producers come up and they get it. They think it's great. They think it's great. They think it's great until they get back to London and they don't think it's great. Mm -hmm. So then I cook another one up, set on a caravan park. <coughs> now, because I'd helped set up Brookside, the caravan park, to me, I know I said it myself, were genius, because each episode, a new caravan appeared or disappeared. So you got a continual rolling narrative. New caravan, ooh, who's in that caravan? They disappear. New caravan, they all came up from London. Top producers went to all Rome. Whoa, it's fantastic, it's fantastic. Oh, it's great, it's gonna work. Didn't get it, got back to London, idea dissipates. So I went to see the head of Screen Yorkshire. I said, what's happening here, Sally? We're bringing all these people, because I, I want to make industrial um, level investment in television. She says, John, I don't think anybody wants to go to the Groucho Club and say they've commissioned a series of, set on a caravan park, because it's to do with class and status. So that kind of disappeared away. During the last kind of 11 years, we've been working on a project which just seems to be on the cusp of it might happen, it might not happen. For me, 
And I know we've had Lucy Beaumont's series shot in the city. In truth, not much of it was shot in the city. It was mostly shot in Leeds. And it's based on an Israeli-French sitcom. So it's, it's, it's a, a homogeny to the region is, is not as deep as you first might think. This is set down Preston Road by people who live in that part of the city. And it has a relationship with a sports club in that part of Hull. And it's also to do with an emerging sport that's not played by men. That's kind of all I can tell you. Um, but the point of it is that if, if, if this comes off, it will be large scale industrial investment of actors, cameramen, locations. I mean, we all know that they're using you know, High Street to film in, but this would be on, an, on a level hitherto unseen. So the investment back would be phenomenal. And the reason I wanted to do that is because I was there when Phil Redmond bought Brookside Close. He borrowed three million quid and he, from the TSB in St. Helens, and he bought Brookside Close. And then you see what happened at the, at the, the, the back water from Brookside was all the growth of those Scouse films that came out of Liverpool mm -hmm. then. Ollie Oakes comes out of there. Even now, Jimmy McGovern's still writing stuff for Sean Bean and all that kind of stuff's coming out of Liverpool. And I genuinely believe, and David Ockney put it you know, best, that we have the best light here, second only to Los Angeles. But it's getting the critical mass of people to invest in the region so that our graduates from the university don't have to go to Leeds to work. They can stay here to work. That act is coming through Wyke and Wilberforce and various, you know, South Unsley and various other places or, you know, Napa and Carl and things like that. They've got something to aim for. And that's another reason why the, the, the foundation is so important. Because otherwise we, we're giving people the opportunity to dream, but they have to dream it somewhere else. And when you dream it somewhere else, we're losing intellectual collateral. So that's, that's kind of what we're working and on. And now you surely is present now, uh, or you could put two and two together while the company's taken the naming rights to a stadium in East Hull. <laughs> or maybe not. You can cut that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, the, that, that, that's what we're working on. Uh, could we just talk for just a minute about what your fe feelings are, the both of you, on the City of Culture thing in 2017? We've had Coventry, and now we've just got Bradford announced as our new City of Culture. We've now got time to look back you know, the thing's really settled down now, haven't it? There's another city of culture been. What's your feelings about what happened and and what the legacy might have been? Yeah. Martha, Martha? Yeah, I think it's hard. I was at university at the time, so I was actually in Liverpool. Um, and then obviously I've come back. I think quite a bit of it was bringing other companies to the city sort of thing. And I think there maybe could have been more actually investment with the people who were there at the time to create a bit more legacy coming through. That's my opinion of it. I don't know whether you agree with that. Yeah, I think the, the, the overriding thing is the city of culture was a great thing. It shone a light. I think anybody in the arts would be lying if they said they wouldn't have done it different. Um, for me, it's really about how you compress the people who don't invest in art with people who do. And, the, and, the, and the, mm -hmm. the, the, the narrower you make that bandwidth, the more we can all say we live in a place which is culturally significant. And I think there were some, you know, there were some fantastic events mm. and there were some events that, that were less than fantastic. Um, I, I would have liked every individual artist in the city to have been given a tranche of money. I actually applied. I've never spoken about this in public before, but I applied to be the chairperson for um, City of Culture. Uh, and I was interviewed in London which, and by a guy who said, what did I know about Hull? <laughs> and I said, well, I live in North Ferriby. What do you know about Hull? Because you live in Camden. Um, and that was, a, that was a really interesting... That was about it, was it? That, well, <laughs> we didn't get on from thereafter, let's say. You know, um, but I would, have, I would have given every artist in the city 100,000 quid. I said, right, 
But that's the way my mind works. So, right, you've got under grand, you've got under grand, you've got under grand, you've got under grand. Make that 200 grand. Or make that 200 grand's worth of value. You know, you could still have your big stuff. You could still have your purple people, you know, and the RSC and, 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 and event today and all that. Um, but that's what I would have done because I think it would have pumped oxygen because the whole idea of that cash is to pump oxygen into people's belief that things can be done. And years and years ago, um, I mean, shoot me if I'm going on, but we wanted to turn the Howarth into a pub theatre because there's never been one in all. And um, when Gareth and I were running trucks, wouldn't it be great if we had a pub theatre in all? And we're still looking, you know, like a 100-seat pub theatre venue in the middle of the city. Because Paul Eaton left all and bought a pub in Manchester and turned it into a pub theatre. You can kind of think, well, why haven't we got a pub theatre? You know, because I'm a real believer that the more theatre we have, the more it festers and creates and, 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 and builds a, a groundswell. But we, we must never forget that some people don't get it. You know, so we constantly have to start from ground zero. You know, to, and, and, and when, when Mark Babbage came to me to talk about the 50th birthday of Old Truck, he said, what would you like to do? Would you like to write, like to, write a new play? I said, not really, I'd, I'd like to redo Teachers. Because I think it's still really important, particularly the way the arts are being dealt with in school, marginalised in state education, that we, that we go back and we re-stimulate those people who haven't had the opportunity to understand that theatre is for them. You know, that, it, that the arts are an open door. It's not some, something somebody else does. And, 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 and I think that's also back to the fundamentalism of the tin. You know, it's, it's very easy in the arts, because we used to do it. We, Barry and I used to go to the Theatre Museum in Covent Garden, and we used to work out a season for Old Truck. And by the time we got to Donny, we'd ripped it up. Because the, because the season in the, in the Theatre Museum at Covent Garden, and the season when you walk around Orchard Park, Orchard Park are two very, very different animals. And that's not to be patronising. That's to understand what your audience is about. And I suppose that goes right back to up and under, because I could have come to Hull and done, you know, um, Murder of the Hope of Womankind, which is a three-handed expressionist play, um, but it wouldn't have had the same kind of connection to the audience. I'm glad you did come to Hull, John. So am I. Uh, and you know this book I've been encouraging you to write. I know you're you too yeah, bloody yeah. lazy, because you say it's too much like <laughs> too hard work. Too many words. Too many words, <laughs> yeah. Well. If they make it into a film, who's going to play him? And that's for you, Martha. That's not. That's not. Who's going to play him in the film? I don't know. Don't say Johnny Depp. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last time I saw him, what? <laughs> Mark had it. <laughs> Mark had it too. Yeah. 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 Uh, do you know? I knew this had run over, but I don't mm. care if you don't care. Uh, would anybody else like to talk to these two and uh, ask them anything? Who, who has the first question, if there is one? John? John, are you someone who was uh, especially influential in your career development? Was there a role model you looked up to who inspired you to create? Yeah, it was a teacher. Was yeah, it was a teacher from... I, uh, I had a um, fantastic drama teacher at, uh, at school. Who, who got us doing stuff that I, you know, I, I would never have otherwise come across. And also when I went to college, the, the head guy at college, he believed in me. It, it was one, one incident. Um, I went to Bretton Hall to train to be a drama teacher and the head of drama, um, he was quite an academically minded guy, a big Laban expert. And I went to him and I said, if I write a play, can I put it on? He said, no. I said, why? He says, it won't be any good. I said, well, if I adapt a novel, can I put it on? He says, no. I said, why? Because you, you, you won't be able to do it. I said, well, if I do it and I bring it and you think it's any good, will I be able to do it? He says, yeah, but you won't be able to do it. So I went away that Christmas, I was 18, and I adapted A Clockwork Orange for the stage. This was 10 years before the Royal Shakespeare Company did it. Um, and I brought it back to him and I said, I've done that. And he read it. He said, have you done that? I said, yeah. He says, you can put it on. <laughs> 
And it was that belief that what I'd created, that John Hodgson, who was the head of the department, thought was worth doing. So, so for example, when we meet people, what you've got now in the arts, and you may have it in business, you have a thousand reasons to say no. So you go and meet somebody, and there must be a degree course somewhere where people, you know, they find a thousand reasons. No, it's not what we're looking for. It's not the precinct. It's not the, the Do you know what happens in business, John? The bigger the business gets, the more reasons to say no there is. Right. When you've got a nice small business, that startup phase, yeah. you find less reasons to say no. Well, and, and that's what we had at Truck. I mean, people would come along and say, Jill Adams, for example, who was Lucy Bowman's mum, she came along and she said, I want to write a play about taxi drivers. I said, I don't think it'll work, but I've been asked to write some up for Old Daily Mail. Why don't you see if they want your taxi driver's idea? So she went to write this thing about taxi drivers for Old Daily Mail. Then she come back, she said, I want to write a thing about prostitutes. Down at by Earl de Grey. I said, well, go on then. What? Yeah, go on, go write it. It starts in October. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I said, yeah, it starts in October. You've got three weeks to rehearse it. Go and write it. So she went away and she wrote a thing called Off Out, which was about prostitution, you know. Um, little story about that. We, on the first night, some of the girls who uh, work on the streets came to see it. And, of course, it, remember at Spring Street, you could take your beer in. But they'd take the beer and cigs in. Right, and it's just after Bradford had burnt down. So the lights are going down, and I'm thinking, I can, I can smell people smoking. <laughs> What's going off here? So I look around at the back, and there's four of them sat together smoking. I says, guys, can we, can we cut the fags? Can we cut the fags? And one of them said to me, well, call yourself a people's theatre. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but they were very, it, was a, it, was a, it was a much more direct route to, uh, to make things work. Phil? Yeah, a question for Martha, picking up on the, the point you made about the arts and business. There's a, there's a bit in Teachers Leavers where, um, you know, would you tell us about it? It's the bit about where um, the confidence that people get from taking part in drama at school and where that can take them. And, I, and I'm thinking with young people today, there's all sorts of problems that they've, they've got. And confidence for me is a massive issue. Yeah, I think that that's kind of one of the big points of the play really is about um, celebrating creativity and, and drama in schools and all that kind of thing and, and it basically says like you don't have to it, you know just do drama if you want to be an actor it's, it's about confidence it's about communication it's about understanding human beings and and I think obviously with the government trying to marginalize like creative subjects it, it's not just about having that as a career path it's about all, what those creative subjects can bring you as an individual growing up going out into the world and having things like confidence, creativity, different ways of thinking. Not everyone learns in the same way. Um, so I think that, yeah, something that's really, really important. Yeah, so a big reason to support the arts and the festival, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? Or do you give in? Rob? Um, <coughs> mine's more of a, of a thanks on question, really. I mean, first of all, I'd like to thank Paul put me on the spot for the second time. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, I mean, I don't know, you know a great deal about the arts. It's not something I really go to. But I think that what you said today is truly inspiring on the points that you said about entrepreneurial, you know, the resilience, the grit, the, the innovation. I think it's a, a fantastic story. You know, and I, you know it really inspired me today, definitely. I, I, I think as well, it's like, just going on that, like when you were saying about the entrepreneurial like points and things, we don't, like, I mean, I suppose it's like anything, isn't it? But you do take a massive risk because you don't know if anyone's going to come. Yeah. <laughs> like, you, we all sit around and we think, well, what, what, what are we going to do? He told us about an occasion nobody did come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 and yeah, obviously, yeah. you have it a visit, don't you? What if no one buys it? What if no one this? What if, you can have it with anything, but I think you, you're like, well, are people going to enjoy it? What if no one comes? Or what if what if no one's interested? Or it's all those things as well, isn't it? You mm. take such a big risk where it's like, is is this going to well, be it's successful? That it's, it's not going to fail, isn't it? So even if somebody doesn't come, like you said earlier, you keep going. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Perseverance yeah. To, to make it. My, so my sister make worked work, in the yeah. doll office. She just retired, and she said, "Kid, I don't know how you can, because you can literally go from earning a lot of money to earning nothing." You know, no, no. Well, I'm, you know, I'm sure we're we're all amongst friends. But you can, you can, you know, we've had we've had bumper bumper years. You know, shows on the west, three shows on the west end. Where you think, whoa, come on! Mm -hmm. How many shows? None. How many shows are on? None. 
So you, so you literally go from earning tens of thousands of pounds a week to earning 100 quid. And that's, that's, that's the, the safety net, the parachute jump. You know, it's Just on the business side, Rob, John once told me the thing is with theatre, it's all about the night. It's just all about that night. Yeah. And I thought with my business, our business, it's all about that customer, yeah. actually. Yeah. If you think that, that's one thing the arts can teach business. It's all about the here and now there. Not business development, <laughs> projections, spreadsheets. It's all about that. And I think that's helped us. Mm, I, th I think it's like as an actor as well, obviously, like just from that point of view, it's like every single night, you're that product, really. People are paid to come and see a performance. So every single night, you've got to give a performance. Do you know what I mean? And like you say, it's all about the night. You've got to, you've got to be on your game, sort of thing, because you're the product. Mm. Do you give in? There's one thing. Teachers are on until the weekend, isn't it? It is. Jam bingo is great. <laughs> thank you. Thank we'll leave you. it at that then, Phil. <laughs> Would you like to thank John and Martha for sparing the past? Thank you very much.